If you have your Bibles, you want to turn into Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12. Genesis is in the first book in the Bible, so uh, went easy on you today. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I thought it was about time we had one of these up here on the stage. Now, this really is the life, okay? See, it's not fair because you guys sit through the whole sermon. Some of you sleep through the whole sermon. So I thought, hey, what better way to kind of enjoy things? This way I can preach longer because I'm sitting. I'm just chill. But anyway, but this is the life, really? You know, and um, it gets better. There you go. So what happens is this is, this is what we, this is, this is great, right? Because um, I don't know, how many of you have a recliner at home that's kind of your chair? Raise your hand. Yeah, some of you have them. I don't have one. That might be a good Christmas gift from y'all to me. But uh, anyway, so this, this is what you do. This is the life. I mean, you just sit here and, and you get your recliner. This, you know, the only way this would be even more perfect was there was a giant TV screen in front of me. And I had a, a, a Diet Coke right here. That would, be, that would be the best. And so, and you know, I don't know, or, I don't know about you guys, but you might be nappers. I don't know if you're nappers or not, but I'm a, I, I'm, I'm a napper kind of guy. I, and, and I think the best naps for me are on Sunday afternoons. You know, yeah, why? Because, you know, God said to rest on the Sabbath. And so in, in um, rest in, in the Hebrew means take a nap. And so uh, I don't really know if that's true or not, but... Uh, but Sunday naps are the best. Now, I'm a good napper, but on Sundays, I mean, I go next level when it talks about napping. I mean, it's just some of the best sleep in, in the world, and, and, and so I don't know, but, but I love this. I, you know, I love this. And so as we talk this morning, I kind of want you to, I want to leave this recliner up here. It's, it's kind of gross. I got it from the youth ministry building, but anyway. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, I, I want to leave that up here because it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's our metaphor this, this morning for life. And a lot of us work hard for this type of life. And, and what type of life are we talking about? We're talking about a life that we've planned. A life where, where we get to set the agenda. A life where, where we're in control, okay? And when we're in control, that's, that's a good life. And, and it's not only a good life, that's, that's a comfortable life. That's, that's, that's a recliner type of life. When we're, we've planned it, we're, we're in control, um, that, that's, that's a good life. And, and there's nothing wrong with a plan. Bible says that, that if you fail to plan, then you've planned to fail. Oh, good. Some of you caught that. That's not in the Bible. I think uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin may have said that anyway. I just want to see if you guys are still with me. Some of you may have already fallen asleep. I want to wake you back up. But it's, it's, Proverbs says that without counsel, plans fail. So there is this assumption that we, we will make a plan, but you can't be so tied to your plan, or should I say, you can't be so tied to your comfortness, to, to your comfort zone, that you would say no to something that God calls for you to do, an instruction that he gives in your life. And if you have your Bibles, I already told you, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to read the first four verses. Genesis 12, verse 1. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make, you, make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It says, So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So talk about a major disruption in your life. Okay, imagine that this, this picture, Abraham, actually his name is still Abram here. God hasn't changed his name. But Abram is living his life, minding his own business, and then God speaks, and God gives him this incredible promise. God tells him that you're going to be a great nation, and that God will bless him and make his name, Abram, he'll make his name great. God tells him that through, through him, all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. And what Abram doesn't know just quite yet, and what God has just announced here, is that the Messiah, okay, Jesus, the Savior of the world, is going to be coming through Abram. Now, this is a huge deal, and it's an even huger deal. I don't know if huger is a word, but I'm going to use it. It's an even huger deal because Abram and his wife Sarai don't have any children. And it's an even bigger deal because the Bible says that she's not able to have children. 
So this is incredible news. This is cause for, for celebration. And I'm sure there's some shock. There's some disbelief. But God says something first. He says, but wait, Abram, what I need you to do first is I need you to gather up all your belongings, your family, and I need you to leave everything that you know, the, the home of your, of your father. I need you to leave everything that's familiar to you. Put your house on the market. Put out the for sale sign. Go say your goodbyes. Give your two weeks notice. You're moving. You're moving. Abram says, okay, where are we headed? Where are we headed? God says, I'll let you know. And I can imagine Abram going, wait, wait, wait a minute. Did you just say, you'll let me know? No, no, I'm sorry. You said San Antonio, didn't you? That's what you said. Or San, San Diego, right? No. God really did say, go and I will show you. Can you imagine that conversation? Okay, Abram just experienced that with God. But can you imagine the conversation that he had with his wife? <laughs> Some of you laughed. You had that one. He goes to his wife and he says, listen, God, is, God has given me this promise. He's going to make a, a great nation through us. He's going to make our name great, my name great. All of the families of the earth will be blessed through us. And we've got to move. What is her obvious next question? Where? And Abram's probably thinking, I knew she was going to ask that. Well, you see, honey, I, I don't know. Or should I say, I don't know yet. God said that he would show me. He just, he just hasn't shown me right now. Okay, imagine that scene. Now, imagine that's your reality today. Okay, what would your reaction be? What would your wife's reaction be? Talk about a, a change of plans. That's a huge, that's a huge get out of the recliner moment for us. Life just got real. And look what Abram did. Look what Abram did. It says it right there, verse four. So Abram, what? He went. <laughs> the dude went. He did it. We don't know if he doubted. We don't know if he asked a lot of questions. We don't know anything except that Abram went. And God asked him to do something, and Abram said yes. And that's where God wants us to get to, where we are willing to say yes. Now, I understand saying no to God. I'm not saying that it's right, but I get it. I'm not about to stand up here and say that I've given God my yes every time. I am not the poster boy for perfection when it comes to being a Christ follower. I'm thankful for God's forgiveness and his grace, and I'm thankful that God does not give up on me, and he doesn't give up on you. But why do we, why do we say no? Why do we say no to God the Father? Why do we say no to God the Creator? Well, here's a few that, that I've come up with. See if any of these resonate with you or sound familiar. It's too hard. It costs too much. I'm too busy. I'm too tired. I'm too scared. I'm not good at that. I'm not smart enough. You don't know my past. I'm not Christian enough. They'll make fun of me. I'll lose friends. This doesn't make sense. I'll do it later. Now's not a good time. I'm at a good place right now in my life. I, I like my job. My family's happy. This would just mess things up. And on and on. Any of those sound familiar to you? It was an easy list for me to come up with because... Either I've used those before or I've heard them used. And for whatever reason, Abram's reactions are not, they're not mentioned in Scripture. He could have said any of those things that I just said or he, he could have said none of them. The point is, is he went. And I want to make sure you catch what it says right after he went. It says, as the Lord told him. The word told there can mean command. It wasn't a question of, Abram, do you want to do this? Or it wasn't, it wasn't an idea of, Abram, do you, if, as long as you feel like it, this is something you can do. Abram did exactly as he was told. It was obedience, not conditional obedience. You know the difference, right? Conditional obedience is where you say, I'll do this, but you have to. Or if you'll do this for me, then, then, then okay, I'll do that for you. Another one is, I'll be glad to do this, but can we tweak the plan just a little bit? Okay, okay. Can I have some, some, some license there to change some things? Abram did just as he was told, and, and that's the best definition of obedience. Do just as the Lord has told you. That's what it means to obey. So how do, you, how do you get out of that recliner? Because that's a comfortable place. That's a very attractive place. And, and the, the gravity, the, the, the tractor beam of the, of the recliner is very hard to get out of in life. So how do you go from, from there to, to where 
Abram was? How do you go from conditional obedience to all in? How can we become a people that give God our yes? Well, I want to give you three, three kind of first steps that you've got to take. And these are in your outline if you want to take notes or follow along. And the first one is this. Obey God's plan. Key word there is steps. Obey God's plan. I, and I can imagine this happening to you right now. You're saying, thanks, Captain Obvious. Real insightful there. Obey God's plan. Yeah, we got it. Hope you didn't hurt your brain coming up with that one. Did you, you, know, did you Google that one, Jimmy? Come on. And I know it's not earth shattering. I know it's not new information for you. Giving God your yes means to obey his plan. But notice the, the key word there that's attached. And it's steps. Sometimes when God speaks to us, that's all he gives us is the next step. Remember how much information Abram got when God said go. Abram said where. God said I'll tell you, just not right now. He was just told to go and God would fill him in on the destination later. But the main thing that Abram was to focus on was the command to go. You see, we're a people, I'm a person, we're a people that want to see the finish line. We want to know the course. We want to know the op- what the obstacles are. We want to know what's the best route. Is there an easier way? Will there be challenges? What can I, I expect? What's this going to look like? How is it, what's this going to happen? You know, what, when it's all over, when it's all said and done, what's this going to be? And that's very much recliner thinking, right? Because that's, I want the plan. I want to know that what's going to happen. We want to see that finished product. We want all the details because we can't make our plan if we don't know all the details. How will I know what to expect if I don't know all the details? You can't just give me a partial plan. I've got to make my plus and minuses list. Give me as much information as you've got. That's what we say. And God sometimes says, here's what I got for you. Go. Proverbs 16, 9 says, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord determines his steps. We could come up with all types of plans, Options, spreadsheets, PowerPoint presentations, lists, whatever. We can come up with what we think we should do, but God determines what's going to happen. His plan will ultimately prevail. You can have your map, but God's going to tell you exactly where you should go. Some of you use GPS. Um, you're either, you either have a GPS device or maybe you use your phone. And you type the address in. You know how it works. You type the address in of where you want to go, and then it maps out what it perceives to be the best route. It takes in... Uh, consideration about traffic, time, blah, 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 blah. And what happens, but what happens when you go off route? What's that word it says when you start, go, when you go off route? Remember what that was? Yeah, recalculating. Okay, it's recalculating. In other words, you just went off the route that it gave you, and what it's doing is it's trying to get you back on the original route, or it's trying to find an alternative route based on the turn you just made or what you just did, but they're still trying to get you to that same destination. For some of us, though, we look at God and we're praying that he will say recalculating. Here's what I mean by that. We don't want to go down the route that he's taken for, taking us. Matter of fact, sometimes we don't even want to go to the destination, much less the route. So we're hoping and praying that there's a recalculating coming, that something's going to change. We want to go a different way. We want to go in the opposite direction. We don't know what will happen if we, if we say yes to that or if we take down that path. That's not comfortable. That's not familiar. That looks really scary. God, give me, a, give me a recalculating. Isaiah 48, 17 says, This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer, Isaiah's reminding these people in case they don't remember, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way that you should go. God's talking to the nation of Israel, and he's telling his people that they've wandered. They've gone down their own path of rebellion. He's reminding them of some pretty important truths here. He is their redeemer. He and he alone. He knows what's best, and because of that truth, he will direct them in what is the right way. And God says the same thing to you and me. He's asking us, why would you say no to me? I am your redeemer. I am your savior. I love you. I've taught you, and I want to continue to teach you and teach you what is best for you. I will direct your past. And oh, by the way, I'm the only one worthy of your attention. Israel ran after what they thought was better. They surrendered to what they thought was right, what felt good, and probably what seemed easier. 
But all it did was lead them down a path that was opposite of God's leadership and away from his blessing. God's calling us to go, but he also says to follow. And I said this earlier with the kids. Regardless of what you think, God didn't leave Abram out in the unknown all alone. God said, go, and I will show you. Just take the next step, and I'll lead you. Jesus' commands to his early disciples, they were, follow me. Follow me, even if you don't know the whole story yet. Follow me, even if you don't know where we're going. Follow me, even if it seems difficult. Follow me, even if you're fearful. And I I think another word, as I said earlier, another phrase with follow me is join me. God says, where I'm sending you, I'm already there. So follow me, I'll go with you, and join me in the work that we're doing. Follow me because I love you and you can trust me. You can trust God, which leads us to our next point, number two there. Trust God's provision. Saying yes to God, that requires us to trust God's provision. The key word there is strength. Okay, we're in the middle of, a, of a, an election season. It feels like we've been in it forever. And, and, and we, well, you watch the news and you see everything that's happening and, and what's going on. And you hear a lot of, a lot of information given from polls. Okay, this, the USA Today poll or CNN poll or Fox News poll or NBC, you know, whatever. The, the, the flag poll said, you know, I don't know, all these polls. And they give you this information. And one of the polls that I would like to, like to take would be with, with people who, who are Christ followers. And the question that I would want to know is why, don't, why you don't obey God when he asks you to do something. I, and we could probably do that in here. We could take an informal poll here and say, why, why, do, why do you say no when God asks you to do something? My guess is one of the, probably one of the top five answers would be this. I can't do that. What God is asking me is, I can't do that. But let's, let's, let's look at that phrase, and I want to break that down just for a second. Matter of fact, just look at the first two words there. I can't. I can't. And you know what God says to that? He'll look at you and lean into you, and he'll say, I know. <laughs> I know you can't. And then he says, but this is not about you. I'm working my will. I'm working my plan. And if you follow me, you, you will definitely, you will benefit from your obedience. You'll get to see me work in you and through you. You will experience things that, that you wouldn't experience if you said no. You'll be blessed by your obedience, but this is bigger than you. God says, I know that you can't. But another thing that I can't says is that the focus is completely on us and it's not on God. We look at our limitations and we say, there's no way. I read this devotional this past Wednesday. It's from Paul Tripp. And he spoke to this issue so perfectly. He said this, When we sense God's call, we typically measure the size of the task ahead, and we measure our previous track record. So we look at, we look at the task that's before us, and we look at our track record and what we're able, uh, able to do. And he says, Many times, though, we forget to calculate that God will accompany us wherever he sends us. So we inaccurately measure our full potential. Forgetting to calculate God is is that he's asking us to join him in doing this. Forgetting to calculate him in, that's a a huge miscalculation. It's like having a, a decimal point in the wrong place. And you know what kind of damage that can do, right? When you have the decimal in the wrong place. The decimal point in the wrong place can mean the difference between 100,000 and 1 million. Okay, that's, that's a huge difference. So saying yes to God's commands is also saying yes to his provision, to his strength. It's all, it's all part of the package. There's nothing left out. There's nothing extra to buy. There's no hidden, hidden agenda here. He's not about to call you to something that he's not going to equip you to do. Let me say that again, but I'm going to say it a little bit slower so everyone gets it. He's not about to call you to do something that he's not going to equip you to do. And Tripp, later on in his devotional, he said, our motivation to continue is only as strong as what we've placed our hope in. So if you look at the task, if you look at God's call and your immediate focus is on you, then guess where your hope is? On you. And so guess whose strength you see? Yours. 
Guess whose limitations you see? Yours. Guess whose fear you're focusing on? Yours. You know what that is? That's recliner thinking. Because recliner says, wait a minute, this is comfortable. I like this. I want to stay here. But remember, with God's call comes God's strength, his provision. Psalm 37 says, The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. The idea of fall there, we're thinking about fall, but this is, this is the word there is more of talking about a stumble or a trip. So we, we're, we're on our way. We stumble, we trip, we're about to head to the ground. So if God's not there, then yes, you're going to fall flat on your face. You stumble, you fall, you, you do that trip, you're, you're, headed, you're headed face first. But that's the point. God is there. God is there. His word says that he upholds us. He's got our hand. God has you, and he's not going to let you go. I think Abram went, Abram, the, the scripture says that Abram went, and I think the reason, one of the reasons why he went, the main reason why he went, is because I don't know if it was immediate or if it was a little bit later, but ultimately he believed that God would take care of him. Jeremiah says, but the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. One commentary I read said that that phrase, I am too young, implies that there's been some sort of mistake. Wait a minute, God, you didn't mean me. You're you're wrong, God. You didn't mean me because I'm too young. God, you've made a mistake. This can't be right. Not me. You see, Jeremiah, he's pretty much struck with fear. He's, He's struck with fear with the magnitude of God's calling for him. God commanded Jeremiah to go, and Jeremiah Jeremiah immediately comes back with youth and inexperience. What do you come back to God with? Jeremiah came back with youth and inexperience. And God quickly replied, you do what I told you to do. I will take care of you. Jeremiah, he was going to be, as one commentary put it, mercilessly opposed and persecuted. How many of you would sign up for that job? You're going to be mercilessly opposed and persecuted. But God told Jeremiah that he would preserve him from the attacks of his enemies and give him the moral courage that he would so greatly need. You see, you can give God your yes because God's command, his ask, what he's asking of you comes with his strength. We have to trust his provision. The third thing there, Giving God our yes means we need to surrender to God's purpose. The key word there is story. The story. Listen again to God's word to Abram. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing, and in you all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abram knew that God was, God was up to something bigger than he could understand fully. For a lot of us, we forget. Here's, here's a key thing. We don't give God our yes because we forget that God's working on the storyboard of eternity. He's orchestrating something that's, that's on a scale that we can't even fathom. If you've ever been in, in some type of band or orchestra, you, you know that each, each section, each instrument has their own music. Uh, for me, when I was in the high school marching band, I, I was on the drum line, and so when they handed out music for, for um, whatever it is we were going to play, I got the, the percussion music. Okay, and particularly I got the snare, the snare music because that's, that's what I marched for the four years that I was in band. And so, and the trumpets, they got their music, uh, trombones got theirs, flutes, whatever. And, and, and even within each section, there's, there's subgroups. So the, for us in percussion, we had snare, we had bass, we had uh, quads, we had cymbal, we had, so everybody got their own particular music. Same thing with trumpets and, and flutes, whoever, there's trumpet one, two, and three, there's all, all, everybody has their own music. But the band director or if orchestra, the, the conductor, I guess he gets a fancier name because he's an orchestra. But their, their music, the, the conductor has every part on it. Not just one part, but it has every part, everybody's parts on it. And why? Because the, the director has to think about the entire ensemble. Me, I'm focused on when to play my, my music. I'm not focused on when the trumpet does their thing or flute does their thing or anyone else. I'm, all I'm focused on is I've got my head right down there. I'm looking at my music and I'm waiting for my part when I'm going to come in. But the conductor, the, the director, he or she has to know 
not only what I'm doing, but they have to know what everyone else is doing and how it all fits together. And why am I telling you this? <laughs> okay, Jimmy, get to the point. Well, because most of us, here's the point, most of us, if not all of us, operate like a person who's playing in an instrument and we ignore the perspective of the director. We're worried about our life. We're worried about our current situation. We're worried about our current circumstances, and we're not thinking eternity. We're not thinking big picture. A prime example of this is when we start here, when we start criticizing stuff about here. Um, and all we're thinking about is, is I. We're thinking about me, my preferences, my family, my, what I want, what I'm trying to get. It's, it's just me, and we forget that the church is bigger than just one individual. When God called Abram, he gets just to, to talk about eternity, and the scope that God works on, listen to this. When God called Abram, he already had you and me in mind. Yeah, so in Genesis, God already had you and me in mind. He knew that we would need a Savior. God knew that he was going to bring a Savior to the world through the line of Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob, David, and ultimately to Jesus. This was bigger than just Abram. God had eternity in mind when he gave Abram this promise. And we can give God our yes because we know that we're part of a bigger story. It's bigger than just here and now. We focus on today. A lot of us, we, we focus on today. We pray about today. Many of you got up this morning, had your quiet time, and you are praying about today. And we should. Today is important. And God, is he's very much concerned about today. But he's concerned about today in the context of eternity. And how today will accomplish what he's trying to do in his forever plan. You see, we have no idea the impact of our yes to God. People's eternities are forever changed when we're willing to say yes to God and his plan. All of a sudden, if you think about, if you think about eternity, then, then the recliner, it's not as significant maybe as we once thought it was. It's not so much of a big deal. We can't lose sight of the fact that God's got all the parts in front of him and we need to look up from our music and make sure that we're following his lead and see that this is not just a solo act, okay? We're not just in this by ourselves, but we're part, we're part of something bigger. We're part of a, of a team. We're part of a band, an orchestra. We're part of something that God is doing in eternity. So we have our part to play, yes, but we need to make sure that our eyes are up and we're watching our director and understanding that his perspective is eternity. Here's a couple of interesting perspective stories. Genesis 22. I'll just read you the, the couple of verses of this story. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, My father, what is it, my son? He replied. Here's the fire and the wood, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham replied. And the two of them continued on together. So here's, here's Abram, our main character again. Actually, his, his name is Abraham now. In Genesis 17, God had promised Abraham that he would have a son. And from that son, he would be the father of many nations. A couple of things there. I, I told you this earlier. Abraham was well advanced in years. He was, he was not a young guy anymore. Way past retirement age. And, and so was his wife. And Sarah was not able to have kids. So needless to say, this news of this promise was probably met with a little bit of doubt and, and some laughter too. But God came through with his promise. Isaac was born. Here was the promised child. Yes, thank you, God. You told me that my offspring would be as numerous as the stars. And when I didn't have a child, that seemed like a big stretch. But now that you've given me Isaac, it's all coming together. Good. And then what does God ask Abraham to do with Isaac? He asked him to sacrifice him. And not symbolically either. He meant literally sacrifice his son. And what did Abraham do? <laughs> he went again. He went. The Bible says that he woke up the next day and went. I don't know what that night was like. I'm assuming that he didn't get much sleep. But he went. And if you read the passage, he was going to go through with it. And Isaac, he's old enough, as we read in Scripture, he's old enough, his son, he's old enough to talk and he's old enough to walk. He's old enough to carry the wood 
And he's old enough to understand. He's seen sacrifices before, so he, he gets what's going on. So he has a, a very legitimate question, and it's this. He says, Dad, we've got everything for the sacrifice except the sacrifice, except the animal. What's up? And Abraham says, God will provide himself the lamb. Now, humanly speaking, this makes absolutely no sense. God, you promised one thing, and now you're telling me to do this, which seems to nullify this promise. You said I would be the father of many nations. I didn't have a son. You gave me a son. I see your plan working now, but now what you're asking me to do is you're asking me to sacrifice this son. God, this, this doesn't make sense. But in the context of eternity, God is working on something bigger. Did Abraham know what was going to happen? I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. But here's what he did know. He believed in God. And he believed in God's promise. And he believed that God would be faithful. So he said yes to God. And he trusted God with the details. Because he knew what God was up to something bigger than just here and now. And Daniel, we read another story. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, this is, I'm jumping in right in the middle of the story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But they've done something, or they didn't do something they were supposed to do, and so now they're about to face consequences. That's a short version. I encourage you to go back and read this whole story. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Nebuchadnezzar's in charge here. He's the authority. Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up, I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then, I love this word, this phrase, and then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? What an arrogant dude. What an arrogant dude. Then who's going to be able to rescue? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. Stop right there. That would be awesome because then the rest of the story would be, and he saved us and life is good and, and that we, we, everything's perfect. But they don't stop there. Look what they go on to say. But even if he doesn't, so that was in their mind. There is a big possibility that we're going to walk into this, that we're going to have to get off of this, and we're going to have to walk into this furnace, and there's a good chance that when we get even close to it, we're just going to drop, we're going to burn. That's a possibility. But they say, but even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. You know, and when I read that, it's like I just watched a Rocky movie. You know, my chest gets big, and I'm just like, yeah! Boom! Even if he doesn't. But I wonder, would I have that courage? How can those guys say that? They know what's about to happen. It's, it's not going to end pretty. Why would they say yes to this? But they're not saying yes to the fire. They're saying yes to God. And saying yes to God no matter the cost. That's what they were saying. We'll go. We're going to say yes. You know why? Because it's bigger than just this moment. And if we could remember that our story, that we're a part of a story that's bigger than just here and right now, I think God would hear our yes more often. Let's go back to that list, okay, that we said why we, wouldn't, why we would say no to God. It's too hard. It costs too much. I'm too busy. I'm too tired. I'm too scared. I'm not good at that. I'm not smart enough. I'm not Christian enough. You don't know my past. They'll, they'll make fun of me. I'll lose friends. It doesn't make sense. I'll do it later. Now's not a good time. I'm a good place in my life right now. I like my job. My family's happy. They would just make, mess things up. So all of those things, you put those up against the story of eternity, and they just don't match up. When we say no to God, what we're doing is we're, we're valuing, we're placing greater value on our recliner than we are over God's eternal plan. When we say no to God, we're valuing temporary pleasure or temporary security and we're ignoring an eternal an eternal story that we're a part of so here we are we're at the end some of you are thinking man i'm glad this is over but some of you 
have actually been thinking about something that God has asked you to do. There's, there's, he's, he's waiting for your yes, and you've been, you've been wrestling with that this whole time. And here's your chance to say yes. And here's what I, here's what I want to do. Okay, I, I'm going to ask Jeff of the worship team to go ahead and come back up, and they can start playing whenever they, whenever they get in place. But here's what I, what I want you to do. This is going to take some courage on your part. If, if there's some, if you're struggling right now with a call from God, okay, no matter how, how big or small that you think it is, but you know that God has an ask of you. He's asking you something. Here's what I want you to do. Whatever it is, no matter how big, no matter how small, I want you to come up to the front. In just a minute, when I say go, I want you to come up to the front to these steps, and I want you just to pray. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be down here to pray with you if you'd like someone to pray with you, or you may need to bring someone. You can come stand right here. You don't have to face the crowd or anything. Just stand right here. You can kneel, whatever you need to do. But, but I, want, I want you to, to come. I, I want you to get out of your chair, okay? I want you, because comf, comfort, recliner thinking says, you know what, I'm going to stay right here. I'm just going to go right, right where, where I'm at. I'm going to stay right here where I'm at. But I want you to come because that it's, it's, it's a... Uh, Coming forward is just a tangible way to, to say to God. It's a small way to say, God, I, I know I need to give you my yes, and I need your help. And by the way, coming up here, there's no judgment. Okay, I know that it's hard when we talk about pornography and we call for you to come forward. No one wants to come forward on that Sunday. You know, or if we talk about marriage and your marriage is in trouble, no one wants to come forward that Sunday because then everyone knows. But no, this, there's no judgment here. This is, just, this is just people saying, I need to say yes to God. And everyone... Everyone needs to be saying that. Everyone needs to be saying that. So that's, that's what this is about. So when, when, I, when I say, after, I'm going to pray, and after I pray, um, they're going to start singing, and you just come. And, and, and you just pray, and you're praying for God to give you the strength to say yes to him. And for those of you who, who, are, who won't come forward, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but those of you who stay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray. And chances are you will know someone who, who walked forward. You will know someone. And here's what I want you to pray. God, I'm just going to put my name in here. God, I pray that Jimmy will give you his yes. That's what I want you to pray. Because chances are, if, if people come, I'm not saying people, there's a good chance no one will come. And that's fine. That's fine. It's between you and the Lord, not me. But if you see someone come that you know, even if you don't know, you could just say, God, her or him. Pray that, that God will give them their yes. So I'm going to pray. After I pray, they'll start singing, but you just go. You just come, and you don't, I don't, you don't have to stay long. You don't have to stay here the whole time. You come, you pray. When you're finished, you go back, but it's just a tangible way to get up out of the comfort and go forward and say, God, I need help saying yes to you.